In talking about military technology, there's a tendency to focus on the big ticket items. Tanks make for pretty dramatic news footage. And after the news coverage of the last few weeks, I'd be surprised if there was an American or European left who wasn't at least vaguely aware of what an F-16 was. Fighter jets and expensive platforms have a way of capturing the popular imagination. Even when talking about cheaper systems like drones, in the context of the Ukraine war, the face of the drone war has become the Bayraktar TB2. This is a system that sprang to fame early in the war and which I've covered extensively in the past. And yet so many of the images that have come out of Ukraine have been of advanced, expensive armoured vehicles, tanks, APCs and IFVs, military showpieces that may have rolled down Red Square in previous years, being harassed and sometimes knocked out by $3,000 hobby drones that someone strapped a grenade to. The usage of these small drones has evolved rapidly and they've been adopted on a lavish scale. And it's that combination of rapid improvement, massive adoption and incredible affordability that makes this video one of the most terrifying I've ever done. Because while the TB2 might win headlines, it's these smaller systems that might ultimately prove more disruptive. Because when precision costs less than an artillery shell and requires little more than a smartphone and an Amazon Prime account, there's no more room for business as usual. So today I'm going to have a look at these smaller unmanned aerial systems and drones and talk a little bit about how they've been used. That's a story that doesn't actually start in Ukraine, it arguably starts even earlier, so I'll be looking at both Syria and the war in the Donbass. Then I'll zoom in for a much closer look on the systems and the tactics that have been deployed in Ukraine, and at a closely related but somewhat distinct set of systems, the loitering munition, aka the kamikaze drone. Because it's me, I'll pair that with a discussion of logistics and where the supply of these drones is coming from for both sides. Then, having terrified everyone with an image of weaponized drones costing less than a new gaming PC, I'll talk a little bit about the counters to these systems that have been deployed in Ukraine, and then immediately undermine any sense of comfort you might feel by talking about additional drone developments in terms of technology and tactics around the world, and what lessons militaries and government might be taking from them. It should go without saying I won't be covering anything that hasn't been published in open source, nor will I be going into detail on particularly sensitive topics. So with those caveats out of the way, let me welcome back a sponsor. And so today I'd like to welcome back returning sponsor Blinkist. Blinkist is an app that takes more than 5,500 non-fiction works and distills them down so that you can read or listen to them in 15 to 20 minutes. A skill which I've noted before I have yet to master. Now Blinkist offers a range of recent bestsellers and a dizzying array of topics. From economics to health to history, Blinkist has it covered. When I first signed up some time ago, I did a quick questionnaire, and Blinkist relatively quickly understood just how hip I was by recommending me a work from the 19th century. It's a classic that I've recommended before, Vom Krieg, or On War, by Prussian commander Karl von Clausewitz. And the reason I come back to On War, despite its relative age, is that even now in the 21st century, some of the concepts that are laid down in that book remain relevant to understanding what we are seeing day to day and week to week. Now your journey may be different. Blinkist is about giving you the information you need to become a better version of yourself. Your goal might be to become a better communicator or a better investor. Mine is almost always to better understand the world around us. A service like Blinkist makes that all the easier. And at a time when other companies are cracking down on password sharing, Blinkist has brought in Blinkist Connect. And what Blinkist Connect does is it lets you share any Blinkist premium plan between two entirely separate accounts. So if you've got a friend or family member who could really benefit from some good reading or listening material, Blinkist Connect is your answer. Which means that with Blinkist's current special offer, you can get 25% off Blinkist Premium and essentially enjoy two memberships for the price of one. If you're interested, you can start a seven day free trial by clicking the link down in the description. Okay, so before we start talking about how unmanned aerial systems or loitering munitions are used in Ukraine, let's have a brief talk about the systems in general. Now, because this is an area of technology that has started to evolve and proliferate rapidly over the last few decades, there's still a lot of debate out there over how they should be classified. It's not quite as bad as the US Army's M1 problem, but it can still be confusing at times. Generally speaking though, these unmanned aerial systems, or these drones, are classified based on a couple of characteristics and their role. How heavy they are, how far they can fly, what is their control system, is it line of sight or over the horizon, and how are they intended to be used. And that classification system is absolutely necessary because otherwise when the military says it wants to buy drones, you don't know if you're talking about the kind of thing that can survey the entire territory of South Korea in a day, 
the way the US RQ4 can, or a flying selfie camera that you confiscated from a school student. And if you work in procurement, you're going to want to avoid getting the prices mixed up between those two extremes, lest you find yourself at the front of the news cycle for all the wrong reasons. At the upper end of the food chain, you've got what NATO would classify as Class 3 unmanned aerial systems. These are the big boys, the high-end systems that might cost as much as some manned aircraft. Now, even within this class, you've got some variety. You've got some of your strike and combat systems, like the MQ-9 Reaper. You've got your high-altitude, long-endurance systems, like the RQ-4, the Global Hawk that I've got there on screen, and your medium-altitude, long-endurance systems, like the Israeli Heron. The point is this category is filled with a diverse variety of unmanned aerial systems. Really, they can come in all sorts of unique shapes and sizes, like the completely unrelated and unique American MQ-9 Reaper and Chinese Wing Loon Drone that you see on screen now. But if you're looking for some basic characteristics, here they are. These are relatively large systems, they're going to be flying from a runway, they're going to fly at relatively high altitude, they're going to have a control system so that you can interact with them, beyond line of sight, so well over the horizon, and they're generally going to be controlled by higher echelons. Important people get to decide where these drones fly. No matter what Call of Duty taught you, Private Conscriptovich does not in fact get direct control of a Reaper just because he hit a kill streak. Now if you knock very roughly a zero off the price, you end up in Class 2 and the realm of tactical fixed-wing drones. These things are generally going to fly at much lower altitude, they might have long endurance, but their range from the control station is going to be limited, and because they're cheaper, you might be able to trust them to comparatively lower echelons. Based on its control scheme and maximum altitude, this is where you would probably put the TB2 drone, which compared to the MQ-9 from before is absolutely a bargain option, but also still far too large and far too expensive to be covered in this episode. No, we're interested today in systems so affordable you could buy them with the national equivalent of a millennial's budget. So today we're really interested in Class 1 unmanned aerial systems. And at this point we're skipping things like runways for most of the designs. The Russian Orlan 10, which you see on screen, is launched with a catapult and then recovered using a parachute. While at the smallest end of the spectrum, when you start talking about mini and micro drones that could be operated at a platoon or a squad level, a lot of those are going to be rotor designs. Or they're going to be light enough to hand launch using something like a mobile catapult which is a good thing because while infantrymen are perfectly happy to carry a lot of weight around, no one's found a way to carry a mobile runway. Systems in these categories are going to fly low, they are going to fly slow, but they're also going to be cheap and portable enough that they can be widely issued. And in this category, alongside dedicated military systems, you also find those civilian drones bought off the shelf and pushed into military service. And so to make things easier in this presentation, where we're mostly talking about the small and cheap stuff, I'm going to steal a trick from the Joint Air Power Competence Center's report on countering unmanned aircraft systems. When we're talking about expensive, advanced, purpose-built military systems, like the Bayraktar TB2, I'm going to call that a UAS. When I'm talking about a $3,000 off-the-shelf drone that someone bought off Amazon Prime and strapped a 40mm grenade to, that's a drone. Those aren't formal definitions, it's just useful shorthand, and the focus of this video is going to be on those drones and loitering munitions. So before we jump into some of the innovative ways drones have been used in Ukraine, I thought it'd be worth quickly turning the clock back to the 2010s, because a lot of the things we're starting to see now we've already seen in the past in Syria, Iraq, or the long series of skirmishes in the Donbass from 2014 onwards. They say that necessity is the mother of all invention, and the long and desperate fighting and associated human tragedy of the Syrian civil war and also the fighting in Iraq against ISIS certainly gave rise to an awful lot of necessity. These are, after all, conflicts that included a lot of non-state actors and state actors with limited supplies of ordnance. The Syrian civil war, for example, gave us the horrifying sight of Assad forces basically filling barrels full of explosives and rolling them out the back of helicopters. Not because a barrel is a superior weapon system to something like a JDAM, but because barrels were cheap and available. If I ever do a dedicated video on the Syrian civil war, be prepared to see some incredible improvisation. We're talking about people making ammunition out of propane tanks, or employing slingshots and catapults as delivery mechanisms. And as you can probably imagine, many of the non-state actors involved didn't exactly have the benefit of a thriving military aviation sector. And so, improvisation and off-the-shelf systems were the order of the day. And while Syria was becoming the drone warfare lab for the Russians, 
the fighting in the Donbass was where Ukraine's learnings were taking place. And the story of Ukrainian drone operations in the Donbass between 2014 and 2022 is not some uninterrupted stream of wins and victories. The Ukrainian army of 2014 had very limited drone capabilities. A lot of the doctrinal, tactical and technical development work had to be done by volunteers and NGOs, with perhaps the most famous being Aerorozvidka, which basically translates simply to aerial reconnaissance. And even with these units involved, many Ukrainian drone deployments ended in embarrassing and sometimes high-profile failure. There were occasions in which Ukrainian drone operators were tracked to their point of operation and engaged by Russian forces. On other occasions, Russian electronic warfare crews won some major victories, hijacking or downing drones en masse. And so while videos of the current conflict might look like anyone could pick up a drone and be effective on the Ukrainian battlefield, the reality is it took years of iteration to get to that point. Technical modifications and changes to tactics were necessary to decrease the impact of Russian electronic warfare and reduce system losses. And sometimes entirely new systems had to be developed from scratch. The RA team, which you can see there on screen, is a result of that development process. It's a homegrown Ukrainian design with eight rotors so that it can get back to base even if it takes damage to one or more of them. It has thermal optics available to it and a greater payload capacity. The intention was to build a platform that was much more capable of doing reconnaissance and strike missions, while at the same time also being more survivable and still affordable. My point is that a lot of what we see in Ukraine today isn't spontaneous. It's not a result of a lot of nerds going and grabbing drones off the shelf in February 2022, going to war and being massively effective. It's a result of years of technical and tactical development. As with so many things in life, it takes an awful lot of hard work to make something look easy. Which brings us to the present, or the war that began in February 2022. And what I thought I'd do was split this up into the systems that are being deployed, just for a little bit of background, and then an examination of how they're being used. And given the fact that there are dozens and dozens of types of drones in use in Ukraine, what I've done is grouped them together into a couple of shorthand categories. The first are your cheap quad-rotor type designs. These are usually off-the-shelf civilian technology that have been provided by volunteers or by government to frontline units, and then are being used for either reconnaissance or strike missions. Colloquially, you'll often see these referred to as Mavics because the DJI Mavic 2 and 3 are some of the most common models in Ukrainian and Russian service. Jury is still out on whether or not the pronunciation should be changed to Mavich while in Slavic service. In terms of defining characteristics, these things are light, relatively simple to operate, incredibly cheap and available on the open market. A quick search on Amazon, for example, showed me that I could purchase a DJI Mavic 3 Classic for under 3,000 Aussie dollars, which literally puts it in the same price category as some unguided artillery shells. For that price, you get roughly 45 minutes of flying time, a controller that almost anyone can use, and a relatively basic but still very useful camera suite. And given that affordability, these things have been provided by volunteers and other organisations en masse. They've been modified in Ukraine by both sides for a range of purposes, including dropping small munitions. And while they have a range of drawbacks, including unmodified DJI drones being vulnerable to the aeroscope system, which we'll talk about later, and relatively limited payload capacity, we need to keep going back to that thing where these things are very, very cheap and available literally off the shelf online. It means volunteers can deliver them by the truckload and troops can afford to use them in a way that risks them being destroyed. Add a zero to the price tag and you're in the category of thermal and heavier drone systems. A lot of these are still off-the-shelf technology. They're still things that you can order online in many cases or hack together in a workshop. But they add a variety of other features including, as the name would suggest, thermal optics to enable them to operate at night, as well as, at least in some cases, greater size and with that greater size, increased carrying capacity. If you're looking for examples, an off-the-shelf one might be the DJI M30T, with the T standing for thermal. That'll set you back about 14,000 American, but give you ordinary optics, thermal optics, and a laser rangefinder. Geez, I'm sure the manufacturer must be shocked that these things are being used for military purposes. Who would ever want access to a flying laser rangefinder and a thermal camera on the modern battlefield? A little dearer would be something like the Ukrainian homegrown R18 drone. These things you can't buy off the shelf, but the concept is basically the same. It's a larger drone, the price given by the manufacturers is about 45,000 US dollars. 
But in exchange for that sticker price, it's much more well adapted for military purposes. It has the extra rotors for survivability, it's got a good optics suite, and it's capable of carrying, importantly, a much higher payload. Instead of carrying a single, small, makeshift explosive, one of these might easily carry, and has been seen carrying, three anti-tank grenades. And whereas foreign companies may put restrictions against military use in their terms of service or their export agreements, I suspect the equivalent Ukrainian contracts actively encourage it. Next up are loitering munitions, which are sometimes also called kamikaze drones. Now these systems feature an integrated warhead, so they're going to be destroyed when they hit their target. Their ultimate objective is to ram headfirst into something the operator doesn't want to be there anymore. How they get to that point varies weapon to weapon. If you're talking about something larger, like the Iranian Shahids in Russian service, those are just going to proceed to a pre-programmed target and ram nose first into that objective. Other systems are designed to loiter, hence the name. They might circle in an area waiting for an operator to identify a target, designate that either with the system itself or with another drone, at which point the loitering munition will be tasked against that target, engage it, and hopefully destroy it. Unsurprisingly, you can't buy ready-made loitering munitions off Amazon Prime. These are military products. And even the American Second Amendment doesn't stretch as far as privately owned long-range precision-guided munitions. Although terrifyingly enough, while you can't buy your own ready-made loitering munition, the Ukraine war is proving that you can sort of build your own. And that's where the final category of drones comes in, FPVs. FPV stands for First Person View, and it really describes the control scheme of a drone rather than the drone itself. Whereas most quad rotor drones will be controlled with a tablet, a smartphone, or a controller and a screen, FPVs usually involve a headset, which the user wears, and a secondary controller, which gives the user a first-person view, basically looking forward from the drone in question. A lot of these are civilian racing drones, so they're small, light, designed to go fast. Given the difference in control scheme and performance characteristics, they're generally considered harder to fly than ordinary quad rotors, but they do have performance characteristics for a particular task. And so what we have seen the Ukrainians in particular do is sling a warhead underneath an FPV and then have the drone operator pilot them into a target. That warhead might be a grenade, something custom built, or the explosive section of an RPG-7. The result is that the pilot is able to manually pilot a warhead into a particular target, essentially filling some of the role that would normally be filled by a dedicated loitering munition. And such is the success of this technology that we have seen Ukrainian ministries ordering more and more of these devices in recent months. But that's starting to touch on issues of utilisation and efficacy, which is really the next section, so maybe it's time to move on. The key point is that FPVs are essentially racing drones where the finish line is an opposing armoured vehicle. And the prize for winning is arguably national survival. Which brings us to the discussion of how these systems are being used and how effectively they ultimately are. And because it's me, we have to get some caveats in first before that discussion. The first thing to say in reference to the fog of war is that drone footage of this war is everywhere. It's one of the very public faces of this conflict. Wherever a drone goes, it's usually recording, which means if it accomplishes something, there's likely to be footage. And both sides have been making use of drone footage to its utmost for propaganda purposes. And that includes every dodgy trick in the book. Sudden and dramatic cuts in the editing in order to make the footage deceptive. Mislabeling or reposting old footage as footage from more recent events. Or, in the most brazen cases, taking footage posted by the other side and reposting it, claiming it's your own. Given the fact that both sides are using many of the same vehicle designs, all it sometimes takes to turn a field of destroyed Russian vehicles into destroyed Ukrainian vehicles is an alteration to the subtitles and video description. The second and very important point to be aware of is publication bias. Drone footage is usually released by drone operators. And drone operators in military service don't get to release footage just because they believe in the free exchange of information, but because that release has a purpose. That means what you get to see is a small subset of all the footage that is taken. And if you think about the kind of things that are likely to be excluded from the footage that's released, Failed attacks are probably the first things that come to mind. By specifically asking around, I've been able to find more examples of footage of failed attacks, but for the most part, the things you see in the public domain are all successes. Just like those fake sports betting or stock picking gurus who post only images of the bets where they win big and never the tips that result in users being wiped out, 
When you look at the footage coming from drone operators, you're really usually only seeing the W's, not the L's. It's not so much a war journal as a war Instagram feed, carefully curated to give a particular image. But on the flip side, you're sometimes not seeing the most impressive wins out there for reasons of security and secrecy. Tactics, techniques, and technology are all sensitive. The more the enemy knows about them, the easier they can be countered. And so if there is a system or a technique that is working particularly well, expect to see zero video evidence of it in action. To illustrate the point, let me ask you a question. The US has included more than 1,800 Phoenix Ghost loitering munitions in its announced aid packages and 700 plus Switchblade 300s. How many confirmed images or videos have you seen online of the Phoenix Ghost? Google it, have a look. You'll find news stories using artists' impressions or images of people operating entirely different drones. There's an insider article there about the Phoenix Ghost and the picture is of a bloody DJI quad rotor. So when you're talking about the sample of footage that we're interpreting, it's actually even more narrow than just the Ws. It's things that are impressive enough to have propaganda value, but not so impressive or sensitive or secret that they give away valuable information. But still, there is an enormous volume of footage out there. More of it is posted every single day. It's one of the reasons I get particularly annoyed when I see individuals post insultingly low casualty estimates for the Russian army, for example. The footage that is out there tells a different story. But in relation to that footage, I'm going to make a quick warning. People who are doing open source intelligence work often consume a lot of this material, and it is good in general if you are watching videos on the internet and you want to check what you're being told. You want to verify things for yourself. You want to go back and check the primary sources. But... I would strongly advise viewer discretion before you go off and start looking at some of these drone attack videos. This can be very powerful, impactful, personal material. It's going to impact different people in different ways, but remember, modern optics are pretty good. The zoom can be pretty tight. And so if you want to sleep soundly at night, you might want to look elsewhere. I obviously won't be including anything confronting in this presentation, but just a warning if you want to go off looking on your own. All right, warnings given and caveats in place. Let's talk about how these drones are being used in Ukraine. And the easy answer is that it would probably take less time to describe the way drones aren't being used than the ways they are. One Ukrainian I spoke to described the battlefield as so drone infested that it's become hard to tell which side individual drones are on. There are still specialized drone units, but at the same time, I'm told every self-respecting Ukrainian company has a drone team now. And while larger drones like the Russian Orlan are easier to identify, and given their size and capabilities, more likely to merit something like a man pads in order to bring down, the Mavics are so cheap and so common that units might restrict themselves to small arms and handheld jammers in order to bring them down. And given the sheer number in the air and the difficulty of identifying friend from foe, the decision of whether or not to take down a drone often ends up being based on suspicion. Where is it hovering and what positions does it appear to be observing? If the answer is a little too suspicious, well then the jammers come out. Although even that is only likely to provide temporary relief because there's usually plenty more where that came from. In terms of employment, the most basic, the most important, the default role for the use of drones on the battlefield remains reconnaissance. And in this role, even a very, very basic drone has massive advantages over a human scout. For one thing, the optics on a drone have zoom functionality without needing binoculars. The recording system on a drone is more reliable than human memory. Even the most athletic scouts have difficulty jumping 1 to 200 metres in the air to get a bird's eye view. And human scouts tend to complain a lot more when they're sent on what are basically suicide missions. And so drones take on both a proactive and a reactive reconnaissance role. A unit preparing to launch an attack might send up several birds in order to try and pick out enemy positions and plan their assault. On the flip side, a unit that suddenly finds itself under attack might launch its drones in order to get a better bird's eye view of the attackers. And for night operations in particular, thermal drones come into their own with their ability to spot targets through even some concealment. Now obviously drones aren't perfect at reconnaissance or without limitations, they're vulnerable to electronic warfare, which we'll talk about later. They're hard to see against the sky a lot of the time, but many of them are quite noisy. And it probably won't surprise you to know that most civilian drone makers neglect to include armour plating in their design, so they're very vulnerable if anything should hit them. But there's plenty of evidence of these drones making their way relatively close to opposing positions and bringing back valuable intelligence. If the quintessential challenge is, as the Duke of Wellington said, finding out what is on the other side of that hill, well, drones offer a cheap, 
affordable, low-risk mechanism for doing so. The second rule that's worth mentioning is spotting for and correcting artillery fire, and I'd argue that this is probably far more important than the direct strike role that we'll talk about in a moment and which gets all of the attention. In this respect, drones are essentially augmenting or even replacing the role of the human forward observer. They can fly up into the sky, use their optics to spot targets. If they have onboard computers and laser rangefinders, they can get the coordinates of that particular location, and that can be used by artillery to then engage the target. If the artillery rounds are off target, well, the drone provides instant feedback, which allows the artillery to adjust and put the next volley of shells, hopefully, on the target. Now, in order to make best use of this information, proper networking and communications are really valuable, which is why systems like GIS ARTA come into it in terms of really explaining some of the efficacy of Ukrainian artillery. But given the sensitivity of those systems, I'm just going to sort of gloss over them for the moment. Another thing that drone spotted artillery allows is in some cases, artillery can basically be their own spotters. An artillery battery or even an individual artillery piece that has a drone as part of the unit might be able to spot targets itself in the absence of any designations from elsewhere out to distances of 10 or 15 kilometers. That may not be a particularly common practice, but drones do make it possible. And a drone that can fly 15 kilometers certainly gives you a better self-spotting distance than putting Steve on the roof with a pair of binoculars. And there are other reasons that this mission, as opposed to the direct strike mission, probably deserves a lot more attention. Drones that are doing artillery spotting don't have to get as close to their targets as those that are trying to bomb them directly, which makes it easier to keep the drone survivable. An infantryman might be able to hit a drone using their AK if it's hovering 80 meters in the air over one of their vehicles, but they're gonna struggle if the thing's a kilometer away. It's also attractive from an engineering perspective because it means you don't have to put the payload, namely the shell, on the vehicle itself. Payload is heavy, it requires additional power, it imposes weight and range restrictions, and it increases cost. So if you can just have the drone find the target and artillery somewhere else stock the shells and deliver those shells to the identified target, well that saves weight on the drone itself. And as an approach, the evidence is that this works relatively well. If you look at the recent battles around Kherson or around Vuledar, then drone-spotted artillery fire is a constant feature. Meanwhile, on the Russian side, some of their systems like Krasnopol, which is a guided artillery shell, require laser designation, usually from a drone, in order to function at all. A usage that we've seen less of, but some evidence of, is direct control and coordination of small units during operations. We have evidence, for example, of Ukrainian Special Operations Forces cooperating during night operations with a thermal viewing drone overhead. The drone operator spots potential targets and recommends courses of action. Again, because in terms of visibility, being 80 meters up in the air is a huge advantage. Similarly, we have plenty of testimony from the fighting around Bakhmut to suggest that Wagner offensives in particular would be closely monitored by drone operators who would issue directions to the troops engaged in the attack and also call in artillery and fires to support those movements. Now, I do want to be careful with my observations here. I imagine there's a number of infantrymen out there that would be a little bit nervous, in fact, if the lieutenant had access to a drone and was able to, with a sky eyes view, micromanage every member of the platoon. But as a concept to improve situational awareness and coordination at the small unit level, this seems to an outsider like it might have merit as a concept. Plus, it might save you some casualties if every time you come to a corner, you can send the drone around first rather than having Private Conscriptovich stick his head out. And then there's the role that dominates all of the discussions and so much of the combat footage that comes out, the direct strike role. This is where the drone itself is launching an attack on enemy personnel or enemy infrastructure and equipment. In most cases, this means modifying a drone to carry a grenade or something on the underside and dropping that grenade on a target, giving this sort of role its other colloquial name, drone dropping. Now, obviously, in the case of mostly civilian drones, grenade attacks was not on their intended list of hobby functions, and as a result, drones have to be modified to be used in this role. There are a range of both hardware and software modifications that usually need to be made for this role, usually leveraging advantages in things like 3D printing in order to operationalize. Unsurprisingly, I will be going into exactly zero detail of how these modifications are done but the end result is usually a drone carrying a small payload that can be anything from a small improvised explosive to, in the case of the R-18, three anti-tank grenades. Then the basic idea is that like some dystopian video game, you pilot the drone out over a target, release the munitions, and job done. 
Now, the efficacy of these drone attacks are a matter of immense debate. On balance, much more footage of successful drone attacks seems to come out of the Ukrainian side as opposed to the Russians, and therefore, as you can imagine, views are often divided on national lines. On one hand, there are those that argue these attacks are primarily for propaganda purposes, that they have no real military utility, and they usually suggest that by pointing out that many of the attacks seem to be on vehicles that are already abandoned. The idea, then, is that the Ukrainians are just going out and bombing vehicles that are already destroyed in order to create good propaganda footage. On the other hand, there are those who probably want to cancel the B-21 Raider program in order to equip the US military with 20 million Mavic quad rotors. That side will often argue things like the attacks on expensive vehicles like tanks seem to be very, very, very effective, and infantry seem incapable of shooting down drones even when the drones get relatively close. As always, it seems, annoyingly enough, I'm going to position myself somewhere in the middle. Regarding attacks on seemingly uncrewed vehicles, I think it's wrong to suggest these are just propaganda. There's plenty of reasons a drone might want to attack a vehicle that isn't currently crewed and moving. On one hand, tanks aren't crewed at all times. Crews can't live inside the tank. I dare anybody who has ever been inside a T-72 to suggest that you could live there for any sustained duration of time. Crews need to sleep. Crews need to eat. Crews need to relieve themselves. Crews need to do maintenance or report to their superiors. During those times, especially at night, a tank is not going to be crewed, it's not going to be moving, and it might be a perfectly good target for a drone attack. And even if a vehicle is abandoned, there's plenty of reasons a drone might want to attack it anyway. If a tank runs into an anti-tank mine, for example, and throws a track, the crew might abandon the vehicle and move back to safety. If the Ukrainians disable a Russian vehicle with artillery or a landmine behind Russian positions, they're not going to be able to go out and recover that vehicle, but they're also not going to want the Russians to be able to recover that vehicle, pull it back to a depot and put it back into service. And so if you can't recover a vehicle, you're probably going to want to keep hitting it until it burns or is obviously unusable. And if you're talking about cost-effective ways to do that, well, having a drone fly over and drop a grenade down an open hatch to cook off the vehicle is a pretty cost-effective and safe way to do it. You don't have to waste a javelin or an Excalibur round. A grenade and a drone will do the job. And so while some of these shots are probably taken for propaganda purposes, there's also a lot of conceivable military utility in attacking a vehicle that isn't crewed and moving. And I don't think these videos are evidence that drones are useless in the attack role. But similarly, the videos that are out there of drones knocking out tanks with dropped munitions doesn't mean we should replace all of the javelins and anti-tank missile systems with hobby drones and grenades. The big points here are publication bias and target selection bias. It may be that a lot of time a drone drop munition doesn't actually disable or do serious damage to a tank. I've seen some videos of tanks shrugging off those explosions. But what incentive is there for an operator to publish a video that clearly shows their attack achieving very, very little? Unless they obviously hit some optics or do some damage, why would they put that video on the internet? I mean, I could make myself look like the best basketball player in history if you let me film myself making 300 attempts at three-point throws from halfway, and then only publish the ones where I actually make the shot. I'm not saying these successful attacks don't happen. We see them. I just question how representative the sample of what we see actually is. And a similar issue helps explain the misconception that drones are super survivable. I often see comments on these drone drop videos basically saying, how on earth did they not notice the drone and shoot it down? Well, the obvious answer is that if they did notice the drone and shoot it down, then you wouldn't have a video now, would you? It's survivorship bias, pure and simple. Just like those successful entrepreneurs who pull themselves up by their bootstraps and make millions and as a result argue that everyone can do it, miss the fact that, well, all the people who don't make it don't get interviewed and get to make those statements, we don't often get to see the video evidence accompanying a drone's demise. In reality, and we'll get to this later on, gunfire paired with thermal optics can actually be really dangerous to these sorts of drones. But if a unit is poorly trained and poorly equipped, well, then the copters can do their work. My core point is that the video evidence makes these drone drops look easy. It makes the humans and the vehicles being attacked by the drones look helpless. It looks like something any hobbyist with a little bit of video game experience, a knockoff Xbox controller and a hobby drone could do. But interviews and commentary from both sides suggest that's not the case. On the Russian side, for example, Merz, who's a volunteer who helps supply, among other things, drones to troops fighting for the so-called DPR and LPR, 
complains that Ukrainian drone attacks work because the Ukrainians have spent years developing the tactics and the system for launching those attacks, and then complains bitterly that on the Russian side a decision was made, presumably at some high command level, to take the DJI drones that volunteers had carefully gathered the money to purchase and use them for bombing attacks instead of for reconnaissance or artillery spotting. And because the order had come down from General Agarkov or whoever, everyone rushes to immediately take the drones that have been purchased and launch little grenade dropping attacks instead, without proper tactics, without proper reconnaissance, and as a result they do very minimal damage, and the Ukrainians quote, jam these Mavics and shoot them out them down for their own pleasure. Meanwhile, more of the complexities and challenges are noted by experts on the Ukrainian side. They stress the need for proper training and for proper planning. An incorrectly chosen attack route, they say, can be fatal, while a bad pilot might lose a drone even without taking off. They also note that electronic warfare is a massive danger, and so operations that aren't properly coordinated with friendly electronic warfare officers can run into serious fratricide problems. In short, quad-rotor drones with 40mm grenades are not some magical eye-win button. They require training, they require tactics, and they don't outright replace other weapon systems. If drones could just destroy all the tanks, then Ukraine wouldn't be asking for more tanks. But when this tactic does work, it can be terrifying and effective. There's some pretty confronting Russian testimonials out there of what happens when these drone attacks are properly executed. One testimony, for example, described a situation where the Ukrainians would identify a vulnerable unit, a unit without much anti-air capability, not supported by electronic warfare, and send out a cluster of drones, six to eight of them, in order to monitor that location at all times. Artillery would be called in on roads and ingress points to force the infantry there to shelter in buildings or trenches. And then the drones would just maintain a constant vigil. It was remarked that normally individuals could move around positions relatively safely. No one was going to drop artillery fire on one soldier moving from position to position. So someone filling up the squad's water bottles was unlikely to result in someone calling fire for effect and dropping 155. But whereas one soldier won't merit artillery fire, they absolutely will merit drone dropped grenades. And as a result, troops stop moving around as much from position to position. Slowly, as the testimony describes it, that lack of movement becomes fatal. Batteries begin to run out, canteens empty, troops eventually need to move one way or the other. Morale plummets until eventually, in the case cited, the unit abandons the position. The drone as such is a weapon of fear as much as it is of attack. It puts troops on edge, it makes them feel like they're always being watched and like death might come from above at any moment. It freezes them in their positions and frays at their nerves. Now, so far, there are only a few anecdotal accounts of those sort of tactics being used. And it seems like the sort of attack that would at once take a highly skilled unit to execute and be most effectively targeted against undertrained or under-equipped units. But it does point to some of the terrifying potential that these systems have. Now, mostly I've talked about Ukrainian drone usage. What about the Russians? Here, our base of evidence is obviously more limited, but I put together some points based on what we have read. Now, the first thing to say is it's not like Russia doesn't know how to operate drones. I mentioned at the start all the lessons that they learnt from their deployments in Syria. That said, a common complaint that I've seen time and time again is the lessons from Syria weren't brought home and applied across all units and across all fronts. In February 2022, the Russians have a considerable advantage over Ukrainians in their number of purpose-built military drones but there are many accounts of a significant deficit of smaller, often ex-civilian drones being used at the lower unit level. There were not reportedly enough drones to give all units the reconnaissance and target designation capabilities that they really wanted. And systems weren't really set up to enable information from drone operators to rapidly get to the point where it could be actioned with a fire mission or tactical decision making. But the idea that Russia wasn't using drones or that they weren't learning, those seem to be patently false. For one thing, we were seeing drone-designated precision strikes from the first days of the war. Russia's Krasnopol round doesn't work without designation, often from a drone. The issue was available quantity and how they were being used, not that the Russians didn't understand what a drone was. Similarly, we've seen some signs of learning and adaptation. Obviously, Wagner, for example, has closely integrated smaller drones into their assault and reconnaissance tactics. And there are some reports, although they're still very anecdotal, of mobilised personnel in Russia 
practicing drone operation as part of their training. But what I and many others are still pretty blind on is just how far those changes have permeated throughout the Russian military. The Russian military is also dealing with some organisational barriers in this regard. Units, for example, complain that they have difficulty moving drones purchased by volunteers across borders, even internal ones. And reports on the recent restrictions on the use of personal electronic devices like smartphones and tablets requires further investigation. On one hand, Russia is clearly trying to reduce instances of troops being located or information leaking because troops have mobile phones and tablets and internet access. But on the other, there are complaints that those restrictions will make it more difficult to use off-the-shelf drones that often rely on those devices as a controller interface mechanism. But whereas Russian drone usage has suffered from some barriers, their use of loitering munitions has been on a much larger scale than the Ukrainians and scored some notable successes. At the battlefield level, there's been extensive employment of loitering munitions like the Lancet series. These are loitering munitions with 30 to 4 minute endurance and 1 to 3 kilogram payloads that basically operate in coordination with the spotting drone. A spotting drone will locate a high value target like an artillery piece or a self propelled gun and direct a loitering munition to attack that target. Now on one hand, the system has a mixed record. We have videos of the missing, we have videos of the warhead being too small to cause significant damage. And we have some images of the system being foiled by incredibly high-tech Ukrainian defensive systems known as NETs. But these systems are also responsible for a lot of kills on high-value Ukrainian hardware, M777 artillery pieces, self-propelled guns, anti-aircraft installations all being particularly notable. Given the value of those systems, it cannot be dismissed as a threat. Then there's the much longer Shahid-136 from Iran. This thing is being used primarily as a strategic weapon. Technically speaking, it's not particularly complex. It's a simple propeller motor, a warhead, and a basic guidance package. The result is it's a cheap system that'll never hit a moving target, but against a critical piece of civilian infrastructure like an energy transformer, it's very dangerous. And while it is noisy and slow and flies at low altitude, it is, as I said, very, very cheap, which means it has a major shot exchange problem associated. It often costs more to shoot this thing down than it costs to build. Which means as a result, despite it being a pretty cheap system, the Ukrainians have had to put a lot of effort into countering this thing lest it drain their more advanced and more capable ground-based air defences. On the Ukrainian side, there's really no equivalent to the 136. It's mostly short-range tactical loitering munitions. Some have come in from abroad. We have video of the Polish Warmate system and the American Switchblade 300s. The Switchblade's a very light system. It's essentially designed for taking out personnel in the open and has been compared rather, I think, fairly to a shotgun with wings. The Ukrainians have augmented their imported systems with their own FPV, so their modified civilian racing drones, and there's some quite dramatic footage out there of those being used in attacks. What the Ukrainians don't have in large numbers, barring a few indigenous designs like Punisher, is an option that allows them to attack hardened targets or targets well behind the lines. Whether they get more of those in future, well, time will tell. Now, in terms of supply and logistics, unsurprisingly, things are a lot simpler with these weapon systems than they are with more complex ones like tanks or jets. Both sides, for example, place a heavy emphasis on the role of volunteer organisations and NGOs to ensure a good supply of drones to the front line. I mean, you're looking at an image of a Ukrainian wearing a New York Yankees hat with a cat on his lap with a bunch of drones in the background that are going to be delivered to the front line. That's, that's 21st century warfare right there. These volunteer systems often operate partially in parallel with official structures, depending on the system, and they thrive both on close relationships with government and on the fact that in Ukraine in particular, it's become relatively common for those that are working and earning an income to donate a significant portion of their income to support these efforts. This structure also highlights why export controls can be so hard to make work for products like this. If DJI in China says, as they have said, that they didn't intend for their products to be used in war and they don't want to ship them to war zones, well, there's very little they can do if the drones get shipped to Europe and then they get shipped from European countries to Poland. And from there, you know the end of this story. Poland would never, ever, ever allow people to drive truckloads of drones across their border into Ukraine. Now, in the past, firms have used geofencing to preclude their drones being used in places like Syria. But in Ukraine, that doesn't seem to have had much of an impact. Then there's the question of conversion and domestic production. 
I've talked before about how Ukraine's defense industry is obviously under immense pressure. Large facilities, heavy equipment, those things are hard to conceal. It's hard to have a secret tank plant. It's not particularly mobile. And if it is discovered, well, then it's going to be vulnerable to Russian cruise missile attack. Little drone workshops, however, those can be dispersed. You don't need particularly many staff members operating in each of them. They can operate out of small warehouses. It's software, 3D printers, and relatively limited machine tooling. It's an industry that makes full advantage of the fact that there's a lot of trained, educated, technically competent people who are now engaged in supporting the war effort. And then what can't be made or modified at home has to be brought in from abroad, and both sides are still dependent on foreign supply. Russia's domestic drones use imported components. The Shahids come from Iran. The DJI drones come from China. And as well as civilian drones, Ukraine has received a dizzying array, usually in small quantities, but a dizzying array nonetheless, of Western UAVs. The WB Flyeyes from Poland. A variety of systems from the UK. Little mini Black Hornets that we'll talk about later on from Denmark and the UK. Mini Bayraktars from Turkey. Portuguese drones, unspecified recon UAVs from Germany, the list goes on. In short, it's a bizarre and fragmented supply system that's probably only going to get weirder as the war goes on. But given a lot of the products involved are dual-use civilian in nature, I doubt either side is going to become particularly supply-constrained as long as the money is there. And as long as DJI doesn't wonder why everyone in Warsaw suddenly became a drone enthusiast. So that's the first terrifying part of this presentation. Drones are incredibly cheap, accessible, and can attack you almost any time, anywhere. And so it's time to turn to the question of how are they being countered and how effective are they really? The first thing to say is that most drones are shot down. These are not survivable systems. Rusi suggests that about 90% of these drones are lost. The average lifespan of something like a Mavic is described as about three missions. Whereas a specialized Ukrainian unit flying a larger R-18 estimates that about 10 missions is a good baseline. In this way, these sort of drones are probably closer to munitions like shells or missiles than they are to an expensive platform like a piloted aircraft. They're cheap and they have a lifespan. They should be used accordingly. As one piece of Ukrainian commentary noted, if a drone only lasts 10 missions, but it costs $45,000 and it destroys 10 armored vehicles during those sorties, then it has more than paid for itself. But the loss rates highlight the need for the resupply of drones to be treated more like the supply of ammunition than the replacement of damaged and destroyed vehicles. One observation that's made by Rusi and which accords with commentary by both Russian and Ukrainian commentators is that electronic warfare is the most efficient counter to these systems and that electronic protection and attack mechanisms should be available at all force echelons. What that basically means is that everyone should have a way to jam drones and prevent themselves being jammed. As you might expect from a piece of technology that might only cost a few thousand dollars, a little DJI quad rotor is not a particularly intelligent machine. The right jamming equipment, be that handheld jammers or something heavier, can force drones to land or in some cases hijack them and make them change sides. And indeed electronic warfare is so dangerous to these drones that both sides emphasize the need to coordinate between those launching and operating the drones and those running the electronic warfare units. Otherwise, fratricidal jamming where your own side ends up jamming your drones, forcing them to land or preventing them being recovered, well, that can really happen. And reports of fratricidal jamming on the Russian side are particularly common. That said, electronic warfare isn't perfect. While your average quad rotor, if it's detected, is going to have between zero and no chance of successfully surviving a coordinated electronic warfare attack, you can design systems that are designed to operate autonomously in a high jamming spectrum denied environment. They may not be able to talk to their operator while they're jammed, but they can carry on their mission. And so sometimes you just need to shoot the things down, preferably without using a missile that costs you hundreds of thousands of dollars. The Saudis might have the money necessary to fire Patriot interceptors at quad rotors, but Ukraine, Ukraine isn't quite that lucky. And so funnily enough, in response to this brand new 21st century threat, we've seen a bunch of 20th century solutions come out and prove relatively effective. Self-propelled anti-aircraft guns like the German Gepard, for example, have been highlighted as one pretty effective solution. The Gepard system had actually been retired by the German military. And a gun-only system isn't going to do particularly well against jets that are flying higher and faster than ever before. 
but against Russian and Iranian drones and loitering munitions flying slowly and at low altitude, well, the Gepards had a great time. Its sensors can spot them relatively easily, and a short burst of proximity detonating 35mm ammunition is a heck of a lot cheaper than firing an anti-aircraft missile. And compared to some of the other equipment that's being sent to help deal with drones, well, the Gepard's actually pretty top shelf. The popular imagination tends to associate both NATO and NATO aid to Ukraine with higher tech and modern systems. HIMARS, Javelin missiles, main battle tanks. But dig through the list of donated weapons and there's some truly ancient crap in there as well. Lithuania, for example, recently sent Ukraine a number of Bofors L70 40mm guns. The gun began the design process in 1946 and was directly related to the L60 version from World War II. If you took anti-aircraft crews from the Second World War and gave them an L70, they'd figure it out pretty damn quickly. But with the right ammo and sensors, this is a great way to shoot down Shahed drones. And the Lithuanians certainly aren't alone. The Finnish and the Poles have both sent ancient Soviet-era anti-aircraft guns. The Dutch are funding 100 vehicles that are basically a pickup truck with a giant machine gun rig on the back. And America has sent hundreds of heavy machine guns with thermal optics. The idea being that while a drone might be hard to spot with the unaided eye, a thermal sight will make it pop up quite visibly up against the backdrop of the night sky. And so you've got the Ukrainians rolling out 1940s solutions to 2020s problems. And this really only scratched the surface of all the solutions that have been put together. Mobile units, for example, with man pads can rush to areas where incoming drones are expected. If you're a well-equipped unit, that might be an American-built Avenger. If you're a unit with less budget, well, it might just be Pavel and his mates, a couple of stingers, and either some quad bikes or a pickup truck. When all else fails, there's always the option of attacking the pilot of the drone rather than the drone itself. JAPCC calls out the possibility of attacking ground control stations or communication equipment. And in Ukraine in the past, it was noted that the usage of DJI drones in particular by Ukrainians was considered dangerous, with one of the reasons being the presence of the aeroscope system. This is a DJI system that was intended primarily for law enforcement, which lets you identify all the DJI drones that are active in an area and also the locations of the individuals controlling them. There are stories from Ukrainian units of individuals moving out to recover a drone that had just finished an operation, only to be immediately attacked by an opposing drone or by artillery. Experienced drone operators are specialised personnel, far more valuable and harder to replace than the machines they control. And so in a manner that sort of mirrors the old sniper v sniper duels, if a drone operator has an opportunity to locate an opposing drone operator and either attack that location or call in artillery, they're likely going to do so. So that's a relatively quick summary of the way these systems are being used and also how they're being countered in the Ukrainian context. But while the war in Ukraine continues, military developments in other countries are continuing apace. And so it's time for yet more nightmare fuel. Around the world, countries are developing entire new families of tactical drones that are far more specialised than non-dedicated dual-use platforms like DJI quad rotors. The little micro drone you see there, for example, Drones like it have been tested in Ukraine, and the reports from those who have used it suggest that they can get these short-range scout drones to within about 10 metres of enemy personnel without being heard or detected. That kind of drone is clearly designed to be used at a squad level to do short-range scouting. Clearing a building is likewise going to be a lot easier if you can send a drone in first. But if you can think of another purpose, there's probably a drone system being designed to fulfil that purpose whether it be as an augmented sensor platform, as an attack platform, or even as a tool for localised resupply. Although for payload reasons, that last one is probably more the domain of unmanned ground vehicles. And to go along with the drone design itself, there's a variety of supporting technologies that continue to be developed. One of the most talked about is swarm technology. Now to be clear, swarm technology doesn't just mean using large numbers of drones. When you see large groups of drones preparing a light display, for example, forming different shapes, that's not necessarily drones swarming. Those drones may not know where the other drones in the formation are. They may not be communicating with each other. They're just each pre-programmed, so they form nice patterns. In a drone swarm, by contrast, the drones in the formation communicate with each other. They're aware of where they are, and they share information. When an instruction is issued, it is not issued to an individual drone, but rather to the swarm. 
A swarm of 100 drones, for example, might be given 11 targets to attack, while drones will be tasked off from the swarm in order to attack those targets, and if they fail, well, the swarm will register that and task an additional drone. As you can imagine, there's a lot of potential to that sort of technology, be it saturating defensive systems, or just allowing drones to operate more effectively en masse. And like many technological advancements, if it can be made to work, it's more significant when compounded with other technologies and advances. A drone swarm by itself, for example, is one thing. Swarm technology combined with better sensors, high-definition cameras, smarter onboard autonomous systems and facial recognition software, however, well, that's a sci-fi film that basically writes itself. It's also not too far off what some companies, including Turkey's STM, are claiming they're trying to achieve. Although for the moment, at least, there is a difference between trying and achieving. But hey, maybe you're still safe as long as the drones can't get to you, which is where advances in deployability come along. Nations are working on all sorts of weird and wonderful ways to more effectively deploy drones to the battlefield. Whether that means making them smaller and smaller so the infantrymen can carry them, integrating launchers and control stations into vehicles, or you can do what the Americans did in one 2016 test, put a bunch of canisters filled with micro-drones on a bunch of F-18s, and deploy a hundred swarming drones from the flight of aircraft before having the swarm form up and complete its mission. And then there's the ever-growing potential of drones as part of a networked battlefield. What Ukraine has been able to achieve with its Delta system under trying circumstances is remarkable. Major militaries are likely going to be able to do better. In an idealised future world of distributed sensors, drones will collect information, feed it into the network, that will then be fused and redistributed across the network in order to give a cohesive picture of the battle space. It's an image of future war played as a real-time strategy game where as sensors clear the fog of war, information is fed into the network where it is fused, interpreted, and shared almost instantly. At the other end of the spectrum, there's likely to be increasing debates over what to do with increasingly autonomous systems. If electronic warfare is capable of severing the connection between a human operator and a drone, then inevitably there are going to be those that ask, why can't we just give the drone a set of decision-making parameters and the ability to make its own decisions when it's out of contact with its controllers? Why not program a drone to attack any targets that identifies, even in a spectrum-denied area? Here you start to stray into the domain of lethal autonomous weapons, which is really another video in and of itself. But I couldn't cover the topic without at least raising the thought. So if you put all of this together, the experience from Ukraine, international developments, what does the drone threat profile look like? Well, I'd argue these things are pretty scary, and one of the key reasons is their extreme accessibility. Civilian drones can be readily purchased. Whether that be a little quad rotor or something like a cargo drone, one of which was allegedly used to attack a Russian oil facility last year. For some reason, I can't buy a cruise missile on Alibaba.com, but I can buy a long distance cargo drone with some payload capacity. So you have cheap systems that can be legally purchased by civilians that often use control systems that are based on familiar devices, similar to smartphones or tablets. So you've got a pretty low training burden for the basic use of these systems. It's why the Syrian and Iraqi example shows that even non-state actors that are not exactly known for their technological acumen can adopt and use these systems. And so it's reasonable to assume that unless there's some massive regulatory change, these systems will continue to proliferate. There will be more and more of them out there. Then there's the shot exchange problem, which we've talked about before. If it costs a hundred times more to defend against or intercept a system than it does to buy it, well, the advantage is going to rest with the attacker. If I'm firing Shahed drones at a target and the only thing my opponent can counter with is expensive surface-to-air missiles, then I'm in a position to grind down that ground-based air defense. It's like asking them to fight off ants with a shotgun. It's absolutely going to bring down the systems it hits, but do they really have enough shells to go around? To use Rusi's more elegant example, Elevated sensors such as the AESA radar of the F-35 are ideal for detecting these targets. The allocation of F-35s against such targets would be an entirely inappropriate use of the platform. And we've seen that in Ukraine, where a Ukrainian MiG-29 was lost during an operation, shooting down Shahed 136s. So not only was an expensive counter-platform being used, it was also lost. And if you can't take down all the drones, well, then the reality is that on the modern battlefield, increasingly, there's nowhere to hide. The overhead threat, the threat of things overhead, is ever more omnipresent. Lower echelons of opposing forces are likely to have access to these technologies. 
And as their senses improve, well then the effect of concealment diminishes. Hiding behind a bush might work in Red Dead Redemption, but it doesn't work when the other guy has a thermal camera. And on that note, the combination of improved thermal and night vision optics with relatively cheap platforms means a further democratization of the night. There was a period, for example, where Western Special Forces operating at night would often enjoy impunity against opponents that were blinded by the darkness. Now anyone with 12 grand and an email account might have a thermal drone on station. And with it, greater access to information, responsiveness, and precision. So if that's the rather terrifying future threat profile, what lessons can we take from it and what next steps might be necessary? And here, as always, this is all just personal opinion. The first observation is that on the battlefield, there's likely to be a growing battle for awareness and precision. What do I mean by that? I mean that being able to have your drones in the air gives you a massive advantage. You have better visibility. You can spot for your artillery. You can correct your artillery fire. And if need be, and if you have the appropriate drones, you can send your little drones over and start dropping grenades on people. So if you can launch and the other guy can't, then you have a massive edge in that fight. By contrast, if the situation is reversed, say they have better counter options, they're shooting down your drones, or they're dominating the electronic warfare game, then you're in a bit of a pickle. All of a sudden, your sensors might be back to the Mark 1 eyeball. You want to know what's on the other side of the hill? Well, you're going to have to send a scout or a scout vehicle. And your units are going to have to spend time and energy being constantly aware of the overhead threat. Now, that's a deliberately exaggerated state of affairs, but hopefully the point is clear. So just as a battle is fought and won for air superiority at an operational strategic level, you may have more localized battles for dominance of the EM spectrum, or the right to get drones up and keep them up. The second point is that these small drone systems are going to need to be available everywhere, and they're going to need to be highly attritable. In other words, they're going to have to be cheap, and you're going to have to have a lot of them because you're going to lose a lot of them. And that's in a scenario where you could argue the counterplay against drones maybe isn't as strong as it might be in future. So there's probably a need for discipline here in the procurement agencies and among the engineers. Every time there is a new drone called for, I guarantee there will be someone writing the requirement or an engineer working on the design that wants to add new features, that wants to add new bells and whistles, a new sensor here, a new capability there. Maybe we can make the thing multi-purpose until it can sing and dance and open a bottle for you. That adds cost and it adds weight. And so there's probably going to have to be some discipline in design. Every time a new feature is called for, the question has to be asked why. Every time there is an option to choose between the cheap, the affordable, and the off-the-shelf, and the expensive, the capable, and the custom, there has to be a strong argument for choosing the latter. Rusi observes that, generally speaking, the force might need three sorts of drones. Small little rotor drones for tactical use, single-purpose, cheap, and affordable fixed-wing drones, and the more competent, capable, and complex fixed-wing systems. Because if you try and put all the functionality into the frontline stuff, well, you're never going to be able to afford enough of it. I'd broadly agree, but I'm going to add one caveat here. Just as Western military forces arguably over-pivoted towards counterinsurgency warfare due to the Iraq and Afghanistan missions, it's probably important now not to overlearn the lessons of the war in Ukraine and pivot everything back towards conventional peer warfare. It's likely some militaries will still engage in stability operations or peacekeeping or counterinsurgency. And in those environments, these systems aren't going to be attrited as heavily, which means in those circumstances, it might be worth being able to give soldiers a gold-plated solution with the best sensors, the best capabilities, and the assumption that the environment they're operating in isn't going to lead to that drone being lost. And to further add to that point around drone design, it's important to not overlearn the lessons of the Ukrainian war in the sense that not every opponent is going to be a civilian drone that's been repurposed. There's a lot that governments can do and are already doing to build vehicles that are in the same weight and cost class but are much more optimised for the military role. This ranges from relatively simple things like securing the drone's communication or using software that's more optimised for military tasks through to adding things like a backup inertial navigation system so that if a drone is jammed and loses communication with its controller, instead of landing in place the same way a civilian quad rotor might, it instead is able to navigate roughly to the area that it was launched from. Simple changes like that would lead to a drone being a much harder target than your average Mavic, and coupled with other technical adaptations, reduce the chance of a drone being shot down. Speaking of losing drones, efficient countermeasures are essential. Militaries and governments are going to need better shields to go along with the increasingly capable swords. What's probably needed from a technical perspective is a suite of systems that offer better detection so you can find the drones, 
and then the option to electronically or kinetically neutralise and kill them. The future can't be one in which we fire Patriot missiles at AliExpress drones. And so there's a variety of systems and concepts in development. Drone hunting drones, electronic warfare systems, old school gun based short range air defences, and in the future, directed energy weapons. The oversimplified takeaway at a requirements level is you need a counter that solves the shot exchange problem and which can be made available with at least a solution at just about every level. It doesn't really matter if Brigade HQ is entirely safe if the poor sods dug in at the front are continuously getting battered by loitering munitions and drone dropped grenades. Training and doctrine are also going to need to continuously evolve, both to know how to counter and deal with the emergence of these systems and also to make best use of them. The Ukrainian experience is already proving that proper planning and good tactics and training can make all the difference to how effectively a system like this is deployed. And as that thinking and the technology develops, so too should the way the force uses these systems presumably evolve with it. Again, the how is obviously a question for army, but from a technical perspective it seems like there'd be an opportunity there. On the defensive side, talking to some active duty makes clear that they're already thinking about the problem. The fact that units need to be aware of and monitoring for the overhead threat. That entrenchment is probably more essential than ever. That too much of a focus on manoeuvre might take away from units digging in in a way necessary to protect themselves, and that how units dig in needs to change as well. One thing that's very clear in Ukraine is that a talented operator of a loitering munition or a drone drop munition is capable of neutralising targets in conventional foxholes. And so how you dig in your troops and how you protect your ammunition supplies, for example, well, that might have to change. And then there's a variety of concerns that go beyond the battlefield that again probably belong in their own video. Not only is the possibility of seeing swarm capabilities or drones that are agnostic to the presence of E-War or GPS on the battlefield increasingly likely in the future, there are also domestic threats and legal and political issues to consider. For example, the misuse of drones by civilians is a potential law enforcement issue. There's a lot of secure facilities out there where the goal is to prevent people getting through a front gate. That might not be enough if there are drones available that can readily, you know, fly. And at the complete other end of the spectrum, there's a question over how governments use these devices. In conclusion, small drones and loitering munitions are potentially disruptive technologies. Their use in Ukraine is not a new development. But the scale and pace of their evolution, well, that's changed dramatically. The extensive use of drones and the success of that employment raises a couple of questions for the future. It suggests that the drones of the future will need to be highly attributable because they are, after all, highly vulnerable, but at the same time they're likely to have significant battlefield impacts. The battle to both improve these systems and counter these systems probably demands attention at every level. And while these systems are making a significant difference in the here and now, and suggest they also give governments and militaries an awful lot to think about. Alright, channel update to close out, and I hope you all enjoyed the episode. Originally this week was going to be the episode on private military companies, but I've had to delay that one because of the prospect of gathering some additional information. I'm working on trying to get an interview, even if only on background, that might be pertinent to the episode, and I want to hold off to make sure it's as good as it can be. As I mentioned last week, the donations for January from the sponsorship contracts went through, and on that note, I want to say my thoughts are genuinely with those impacted by the recent earthquake that impacted the peoples of Turkey and Syria. This channel generally focuses its charitable efforts on Ukraine, and I don't want those efforts to let up, uh, but I will be making an additional donation this month towards those relief efforts. It's impossible to respond to everything that is wrong everywhere in the world at the same time, but that's not a reason not to try to respond to at least some of it. Thank you very much for your support as always, and I'll see you all again next week.